All right, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Good to have you here. Oh, there she is. Uh, welcome to Methetes. Today is uh, session 12, the second session in studying the Bible for all it's worth. We're going to start off our uh, evening tonight with hymn number 490 in your hymnal. Hymn number 490 in the hymnal. This is a new one for me. I listened to it on YouTube a bunch of times. And I think I got it. But some of you may know it. Break Thou the Bread of Life. Hymn number 490. You do? This was a new one for me. So. Break Thou the Bread of Life, dear Lord to me. As thou once broke the loaves beside the sea, be on the sacred page, I seek thee, Lord. My spirit pants for thee, O living word. Bless now the truth, dear Lord, to me, to me. As thou once blessed the bread by Galilee, then shall all bondage cease, all fetters fall. And I shall find my peace, my all in all. Go to verse 4. Oh, send thy spirit, Lord, now unto me, that he may touch my eyes and make me see. Show me the truth concealed within thy word, and in the book revealed I see thee, Lord. Yeah, that's about it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, that is our prayer tonight. That you, would, that you would be the one who would break the bread of life for us. That you would be the one who would open up the pages of Scripture for us and help us to see uh, things that we've never seen before. You'd help us to see the things that you want us to see, the, the, way, the, the things you want to speak into our lives. Today, Lord, I pray as I'm teaching this uh, material that it would be a blessing to students and that um, they would learn tools that would equip them for, uh, for years of fruitful Bible study. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so as we start, usually start off, please break into groups of three or four and uh, share how your week was and hopefully get a chance to pray for each other. All right, so share about your week and pray for one another. I'll give you 15 minutes. All right, I'm going to close us with prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we can be together and enjoy each other's company, that we can get to know how things are going in each other's lives. We can support one another. And if there were uh, things that we didn't get to pray for, Lord, I pray that you would... I know you were listening to these conversations and, and that you are the one who uh, hears and knows and cares. And uh, we, Lord, we put, uh, we put all of our lives in your hands, knowing that when we give them to you, things to you, that they are in good hands. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, come on back together. This is our, uh, this is going to be our last... Uh, last bit of learning Hebrew today. Um, next class we'll probably just, uh, we'll just, we'll review some Greek and read some Greek words and we'll review some Hebrew and, and uh, review some, and read some Hebrew words just to, just to keep it fresh.
That, yeah. I was thinking Aramaic might be. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, speak English. One of my one of my favorite uh, scenes is in the movie Sahara, where Matthew McConaughey and his uh, buddies are on the sh uh, boat and they're they're going along and the uh, this other boat comes up behind them and they say you know throw down your weapons stop and and he Matthew McConaughey McConaughey gets up on the back of the boat and he says we don't speak English and they said you're speaking English now <laughs> and he says I only know how to say I don't speak English in English. <laughs> it's one of my favorite. I like fun scene. All right, so let's uh, let's review our Hebrew vowels. Let's say it together: Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, Wow, Zion, Chet, Chet, say it with Chet, Tet, Yod, Kaf, Lamed, Mem, Nun, Samek, Ayin. Pei, hey. Tzadei, Tzade. <laughs> Kof, <laughs> Reish, Sin, Shin. Anybody? No. Tau. 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 All right. Tau. All right. We've been we've been learning our Hebrew vowels as well. We have Pathic, which Pathic. says Ah, like Father. Segol, which says Eh, eh, eh as in better, better. Segel. Herek, which says e, uh, I, as in bitter. And Kamet Hatuf, which is uh, ah, like bottle. And Kibbutz, which is u, uh, like in ruler. These are, these are our short vowels, right? We then, we then learn Kamets, which says ah, uh, like in bottle. And Tsere, which says, um, where are we here? Yeah, A as in they. And Holem, which says o. Oh. And then there's the Hatef vowels that all have these double dots there which basically says they're like the schwa right so all of these say uh 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 right so the last vowels we're going to learn are the vowels that are written with other letters now uh these are these are very interesting they're called vowel letters and um they're yeah they're they're not easy uh but the first one is uh, called Comet's Hay. And Comet's Hay looks like a Comet's with a Hay. Comet's Hay. Hey. hey. Now, how do you, how can you tell if this is just a, a bet with a Comet under it and then a Hay as a, as a, uh, as a, as a consonant? Because they're both red. <laughs> oh, yeah, very good. Isn't it like there's, the, there's a straight line? The comet says a tail. So this, this could be a comet, right? Or a comet satouf, you might think. And, uh, and it, this might be just a regular hey. But the, the, the truth is, these vowel letters typically happen at the end of a word. Because in Hebrew, they don't, they don't always like having a word end with a vowel. They want to have something else there to show sort of the end of the word. So this... So if you're at the end of the word and you see a hey preceded by a comets, then you're pretty sure that it's going to be a comets hey. It's going to be a vowel letter, and you're not going to actually have to pronounce the hey that's there. In a similar vein, we've got tsere yod. Tsere yod. Tsere yod. Now, comets hey says ah as in father. It says the same sound as comets hatuf and comets. Okay? So... You're going to be pronouncing this the same way no matter where you see it. Just here it, it ends with a, with a hey. Um, and the same is true with tsere. Tsere, uh, tsere yod, tsere yod says a like in they. Just like tsere says a as in they. Okay? But if you, if you, if you listen to the vowel, if you listen to the word they, when you end it, you hear a y sound, right? So you want to have a yod there anyway. So it doesn't really change the pronunciation all that much. It just sort of adds an indicator there that uh, you need to end that with some emphasis. Uh, the same is true about the next one, too, which is Segol Yod. It's called Segol Yod. Segol Yod uh, says the same sound as Segol. Better. B eh, eh, eh. Now, this, this one, you don't usually hear a y at the end of eh. Uh, a, a better, like 
But here, if again at the end of the word, you're gonna you're gonna probably gonna see a yod tacked on to the segel just to indicate that you're at the end of the word. Now, remember, part of this is that Hebrew originally didn't have vowels, and so before Hebrew had vowels, scribes started to stick in letters that had less of a sound to indicate that there was something going on there. So this was this was this is a holdover from when Hebrew actually didn't have vowels. Uh, here's the fourth one. It's called Hirak Yod. Hirak Yod. Hirak Yod says E as in machine. Now this is a case in which the Hirak, which does not say E as in machine, it says I as in bitter. This basically makes the Hirak, the I into an E. I, E. E, E. -E. You can kind of see it, right? It has a, has a Y sound at the end of E. You guys are looking at me like I'm crazy. <laughs> It's all right. I am. I am. Two more. Uh, one. The, the the next to last one is called the holem vow. Holem vav, and it's got a vav and a holem. A vav. A vav. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Right. Vav or wow, and a ho and a holem. In where? In. This one? Yeah. I just I, I just made these all bets so that they're the same. All bets are off. <laughs> Holem vow says uh, has, says uh, O as in roll, just like the Holem does. And then there's another oh, that the comment at the top? Or is that all one? Where are we? This is one vowel. It's one vowel. It, it, it uses the Holem and the Vav okay. to write a Holem Vav. All right, and last is called Shurek. Shurek. This is the one that do, has a name that's not in any of the others. Shurek is like that. It's a vav with a with a dagesh in it, uh, and that but that just says u as in ruler, just like kibbutz. Now, so each of these, almost all, all all five of these six, just say the same sound as other vowels do. Okay, and uh, the only one that doesn't is 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 this one, which says e as in machine. Um, and that's not going to show up in any other uh, vowel. But the rest of them, uh, they just say the same sound that you would imagine if you didn't have the vowel letter there. Um, so this is, this is Hebrew vowels. Uh, I'm going to say one more thing about something you may encounter. Um, a lot of times when you're reading Hebrew, you're going to see a vav, this dude, right, at the beginning of a sentence. Um, in those cases, the vav is saying the word and. You're going, to see a, you're going to see a vav. And actually, when you're reading any kind of Hebrew narrative, if you're reading like Genesis or Exodus or Leviticus or Numbers or Deuteronomy, you're going to see that, it, that every sentence starts with that. And it's just a way that Hebrew has of saying, and then this happens, and then this happens, and then this happens. I uh, do. It's, it's a vav. It's a vav. And usually... Usually with uh, a tzere or a um, hatef underneath it. So, all right. So let's let's uh, let's do some pronunciation here. All right. So again, this is this is comets. Hey, it says the same as comets, which is ah. Say it. Ba, ba. Okay. This one is tzere yod. Okay. And so this one says the same sound as tzere, which is a, as in they. So be. Ba, ba, This is segel yod, which says the same uh, sound as segel, which is e. So this is be. This is e, b. This is bo, and boo. Okay. Ba, 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 b, bo. Boo. boo! You got it. Remember boo. Boo! Remember. Remember. <laughs> All right. Good job, guys. Now I have a cheat sheet. My cheat sheet is like four pages long, but uh, it's a has a cheat cheat booklet. We're gonna, but we're gonna move from there uh, to talk about Bible study. Yeah. Now. Um, I, last week, I gave you actual homework for the first time 
it wasn't just work you did at home, it was homework. I was asking you to do it primarily to prepare for today's class. Because what we're, what we're doing is we're learning how to study the scriptures in a particular method. And I asked you, my homework was, please take an hour this week to uh, do your best to take an hour to uh, use the manuscript study method to observe in Psalm 107. To observe in Psalm 107. Um, and what I did this week was... I got this. I did this with, with a pencil. This was very... Yeah, look at that. Look at that. I did it with staples. I mean with pencils. Alright, so we're, we're going to come to that in just a minute. Um, remember, I'm going to just, rev just review the manuscript Bible study method. Um, it involves it involves using a, a, an eight and a half by eleven piece of paper and sort of drawing all over it, right? But there's three basic steps to it. Uh, the first is to look. The second is to listen, and the third is to live. I, I got a lot of water here. Look, listen, and live. Let me try this one more time. There we go. Look, listen, live. And when you're looking, it's it's basically a way of spending time observing in the passage. You're asking the question, uh, what does it say? Because we are, are want to be students of the Word, the first thing we want to know is, what does the text actually say? Not, what do I think it says? Not, what, is it, what should it say? Not, what does my pastor say it says? But, what does it actually say? And, you want to, and I asked you to spend the bulk of your time all of your time this week in your homework, just observing. You remember we used the Laws of Composition sheet, which I handed out. If you didn't get a copy, I'm ha happy to give you a copy. Which We talked about um, repetition, contrast, right? Continuity, comparison. We talked about the, f the five journalistic questions. Who, what, where, when, why, how, right? Um, does anybody need a Laws of Composition? I'll pass that back to Blaze. And you can have one. All right. Sure. Sure. You got it. Here's one for you. So, yeah. So that's that's the observation step. Now, while you're observing, the first place, the first thing you want to do is to just have it be you and the passage, right? You pray. You ask for God's insight. You ask Him to help you to see wonderful things in His law. And you, it's just you and the passage and a pencil or a crayon or a, a marker. Or if you don't want to write in your Bible, a notebook next to it. right? However you want to do it. Whatever works for you to help you to see better. But at some point, you might have some questions that you don't know how to answer. If you're in a group like this, one of the great things to do is to ask the question and see if you get some thoughts from other people. But if you're on your own, there are some resources that you can use to answer some of your questions. In observation, one of the resources that we use is called a Bible dictionary. Okay? Let's say that you go through and you're, you're reading the text, you're studying it, and it says something. It has a, a name or a place or a concept that you've never run across before. It's a word that you don't quite understand. What does this mean? A Bible dictionary is a great way to dig into that. Um, you, what you'll do is you'll turn into an entry in the Bible dictionary and you'll find... Um, oh, okay. <laughs> I turn to health, disease, and healing and I'm seeing all sorts of diseases in there. Uh, maybe you want to know how the Bible uses the word forgiveness. Right? So here's a, an entry on forgiveness in the Old Testament. Maybe that's a word that you want to get more understanding of. Um, maybe you want to find out about uh, what is a footstool. There's an article in here on footstool, right? Uh, maybe you want to find uh, out, maybe you read the name Mary and you're wondering who Mary is. Well, this, there's an article in here that has like eight different Marys. 
right? So you come across a name you don't know, you come across a place you're not sure where it is, uh, why it's important. A Bible dictionary will take care of those things. It's a way to help you observe better because you get to look at it. It's not going to tell you what this passage means. It's just going to tell you what does this word mean, and that can be really helpful. Bible dictionary, great, great help. Uh, second big help when you're observing, and maybe you'll have it in the back of your Bible, or maybe uh, you'll have a book called an atlas, a Bible atlas. Okay, maps of what's going on in the Bible can be really, really helpful, especially when you have uh, uh, you have passages where a character will go from place to place. Having a map and seeing where they go from and where they go to. Looking at, uh, is there anything that happens there as far as elevation? Are you going up or are you going down? Um, when you take this, uh, when, when they go from this place to this place, were they following an already established trade route or were they doing something new? Okay, An atlas can be really, really handy. Um, what else? Um, here's another, another tool that is very, uh, very good but not very often used. Uh, and this is used for observation. It's a special type of commentary called a Bible background commentary. This is not a commentary that tells you what the passage means. Right? We're just observing. What does it say? But this is a, this is a kind of commentary that explains customs that may be unfamiliar to you. Okay? Um, a Bible background commentary, it's actually divided passage by passage. It goes through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So you can look up, well, there's a weird custom here in Deuteronomy 6. Why, why, what is that? You can look in the Bible background commentary and it'll give you customs that you're maybe not familiar with. I find this to be really, really helpful in observation. Those are three resources. Maps, background commentary and a Bible dictionary it can be really helpful when you're trying to observe carefully in Scripture. Now I'm telling you about these resources recognizing that we now live in an age when you're not going to pull a book. <laughs> you're going you're to pull out a computer. Okay? What I want you to be careful of when you're going to your computer is just that um, if you're trying to follow the manuscript study method, which I, I really recommend that you try to follow it step by step, um, is to try to avoid things that are give, going to give away what the passage means when you're just trying to do observation. The beauty of having these books is the books are, these books are segmented in a way that they're not going to actually give away the meaning of the passage or what they think the meaning of the passage is. So having the books can be really handy. Um, but when you're doing research online, uh, you may have a, a little bit harder time separating out observation from interpretation. Okay, so that's just my little caution to you on that. So observ observation, what does it say? Spending time looking at the passage and letting the passage tell you what's important. The second step is to listen. This is the, the interpretation step. And here the question is now, what does it mean? What does it say? And then what does it mean? And here you're not asking the question, what does it mean in my life? What am I supposed to do as a result of this? Rather, you're supposed to ask the question, what was the point that the author was trying to get across? Right? Why did they write this? Why did God inspire the scriptures in such a way that this would be uh, uh, written? Is it maybe that there's something wrong that the author believes needs to be set right? Maybe there's a concept that needs to be taught. Maybe there's, uh, maybe there's something that you're doing well that the, that the author wants to encourage and to, to help you to do more. But what is the point? Why did the author write this? What was, their, what was their intent in writing it? Now, there are tools that'll help you with this too. Now, I encourage you to spend your time in the text as much as you can, okay? but. The, but when, you, when, you, when you're finished with the interpretation step, when you've done everything you can do to figure out what this passage means, it can be really helpful to pull out an actual commentary. This one's called the New Bible Commentary. You can see this one's gotten a lot of use. My, my cover's even coming off here. Um, this is a one-volume commentary of the entire scripture. I like it. It's really handy. Um, I also, because I'm a pastor and I, I need a lot of commentaries in, in order to do my sermons, I have individual commentaries on individual books. 
But this one has the entire Bible in it, and it's, it's a brief commentary that sort of walks through uh, in, a, in a very clear way what are these passages, what, if, what has the church traditionally uh, interpreted these passages to mean? I would go to a commentary after I was done with my interpretation to just check if I'm crazy or not. Right? How, how wackadoodle am I in my interpretation of this? Right? And, and a commentary might tell me, look, you are actually, you're right on. Or, no, no, really, that, that's, not a, that's not a valid interpretation. And they might be wrong. Um, but at least it'll, it'll let you know that there's, here's a question that I need to answer. A, a commentary can be really helpful in interpretation. Uh, another, uh, and I don't have a book, for, oh, I do have a book for this. Uh, it's down here. Here's a book that nobody will ever need. This is Cruden's Unabridged Concordance. Okay, a concordance is a great was a great tool. Uh, this has every word, and this one is the King James version. Uh, every word and every place that it appears. No, here's here actually. I turn open to the word is. Okay, so here is here here's the beginning of is. Okay, right there. Uh, no, that's iron. Where's is? There's is, right? Is starts here, goes here, 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 down to here. Every occurrence of the word is uh, in, crude in, in, the, in the King James Version, right here. And the everything. Okay? Now, why is this helpful? Because I mean, typically you're not going to look up words like and and the. But... If you want to find every passage that, that uses the word spirit, today's Pentecost, so that's a great word to, to use as an example. Let's find every, every passage that uses the word spirit in the, in the King James Version. Let's look it up. Here is uh, S, S, T. Oh, wow, there's a lot of T's. Here we go, S, P, I. SPI, spices, spice, spin, split, spindle, spirit. Right there. It says spirit, and it goes through, and every passage that uses the word spirit is listed here. Now, they don't print the entire passage. They print a few words uh, before and a few words after uh, the word, and so you can see a little bit what the context is, and it gives you the reference, and you can go look up all those passages in your own Bible. Why do I say that nobody would ever use this again? Because now you can do this on the computer very easily. You can go to uh, BibleGateway.com, go to BibleGateway.com, type it in, and boom, you got there. You got a complete listing, and you can you can run it in any translation you want. And so, a concordance was once a fantastic uh, resource, but now it's almost useless. The only exception to that is if you have a Bible. It has a concordance at the back of it, and you just quickly need to look something up. Um, that can be really handy. Uh, you don't have a computer with you, um, but but typically this is something that I would do on a computer uh, in like half a second. Google can be a helpful resource uh, in the interpretation phase. Um, you can you can look up. Uh, I, I type. I will routinely type up pass type in passages and say, you know, and, and just like Psalm 107 verse six, and then just see what people have written about it after I've already done my own work on it. Uh, other passages in the Bible are also very helpful when it comes time to interpret. Oh, wow, okay, I, I see this passage. It seems to be saying that I, I need to work hard or else God will not save me. That seems to be the interpretation. If I don't work, God will not save me. Let me look at other passages, see what other passages say, and see if other passages would agree with that interpretation. Right? The, the basic rule of interpretation is let Scripture interpret Scripture, okay? And interpret hard-to-understand passages using easy-to-understand passages, okay? That's, those are the two basic rules of interpretation that I think are really, really helpful. Let Scripture interpret Scripture, and let, let easy-to-interpret passages interpret hard-to-interpret passages. Yeah? There's a problem with scripture interpreting scripture when you're evangelizing. Okay. Because the first words out of people's mouth are, you're using scripture to 
validate scripture. Sure, sure. So, so what I'm urging you here is in your own private study. Okay, I'm not talking about this. this I'm not. This is not an evangelistic method. This is in your own private Bible study as you're trying to understand the scriptures. If you find something, you come up with an interpretation you do need to go and check it against other passages of Scripture because we believe that uh, God does not contradict himself in Scripture. You're right. Uh, this is not an, uh, an evangelistic method, but I'm not presenting it as an evangelistic method. I'm presenting it as a way of Bible study. Okay? Um, and the last step of, of this is uh, to apply. So this is look, listen, and live. The, the, your task when you're trying to live the passage out is how do I apply this to my life? What does it mean to me? Okay? What does it mean to me? Now that I understand what it means in its context, now that I understand what the author intended for it to mean, how does that change my life? How does that change my life? How am I going to obey this? How am I going to, what am I going to learn from this? Okay? And as far as resources go for uh, that, I didn't bring one with me, but a study Bible can be really helpful in this regard. Um, a study Bible can be helpful. Another thing that can be helpful is a devotional, right? Uh, if you go out to our, our Welcome Center, we have the Our Daily Bread devotionals. We have the Today devotionals. Those take a verse, and then they urge you to apply it. Right? Um, those can be really handy in terms of helping to apply a passage. Although it's, with, with little devotionals, it can be challenging to find a specific passage you're looking for. But, uh, but devotionals sort of illustrate how one might go about applying a passage. So this is the basic method of manuscript Bible study. Actually, uh, this is inductive Bible study, but we are using it to apply it to the manuscript. Let's use this tool. And we're gonna, let's go back to our observation and let's dig into Psalm 107. Now you guys spent an hour this week, I hope, or so, uh, digging into this passage. I'm wondering, what are some of the cool things that you saw? What are some of the cool things that you saw? Evelyn, give me one. One thing that I found interesting was that um, starting with like line 5 and going on page 1. You have, uh, My lines are probably different than yours. Different. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so on your, in your manuscript, it's on, on line five. In your manuscript, it's, it's the, there's line numbers on the side to help you identify where things are. And going to, it looks like line 16, second page. It follows a certain pattern of, this is the problem that the people had. They cry out to the Lord and he answers them. And then it says how he answered them. And then it's like, okay, now thank him for this. Okay. Well, let's let's actually I, let's let's break the passage down. So you're saying it, it follows a pattern. How many times does it follow that pattern? A bunch, yeah. And what's what's the what's the what's the um, word that that indicates to us in this passage that we're starting a new section? Some. 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 Right. So some wandered in desert wastes. Some sat in darkness. Some were fools through their sinful ways. Some went down to the sea in ships. And then, that's it. We don't have that anymore. So there's four iterations of this, four times through, this idea of presenting a problem or a situation, problem that people are in, they cry out to the Lord in their trouble, etc. So let's let's go deeper into this. What are some other things? So this is a repetition. Some, 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 some. What are other repetitions that we might notice between these uh, these uh, problems? After, Rick, Rich. After each after each major group, he he uses the the fact that his steadfast love goes forever. Oh yeah. He loves yeah, yeah. So it says, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. Uh, at the very beginning. Top, top verse. 
His steadfast love endures forever. We'll put a box around steadfast love. My favorite phrase in the Bible right there. Um, Line 15. Line 15. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. Okay. And down here we have, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. Uh, Let me go over here. Um, Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love. Oh yeah, okay. So there you go. For his wondrous works to the children of man. Um, any more instances of steadfast love? Very end, right. Let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord. So it starts and ends with that. Oh, okay. Now, here's an important concept, okay? This is in, in, in Bible study. We call this bookends. Bookends. Now again... You guys are probably mature enough to know that when you have lots of books and you put them on a shelf, they tend to tip over, right? So what you do is you get those little L-shaped brackets and you stick them under them. They're called bookends. They're solid things, one at the beginning of the column of books, one at the end of the column of books to keep the books standing up. One at the beginning, one at the end. So that's why we call these bookends. This passage is bookended with the steadfast love of the Lord. It starts with a steadfast love. It ends with a steadfast love. And all the way through, steadfast love, steadfast love, steadfast love, steadfast love, is the, is the theme of this passage. What is this author telling us about in this passage? Above everything else, the steadfast love of the Lord, right? When we get to the interpretation phase, if our interpretation has nothing to do with the steadfast love of the Lord, we've not read the passage well. Right? We've not interpreted the passage. If we don't, if, if our interpretation doesn't have the steadfast love of the Lord, that's a major part of it. Very good. What other repetitions do you see? Or other observations? Sally? In. In, <laughs> in this. In okay, so let's take a look there. Um, some, like some wandered in desert wastes. Okay. No way for a city to dwell in. Okay. Hungry and thirsty. Cry to the Lord in their trouble. He led them by straightway, said to dwell in. So, what, so uh, Kurt, you said? In from the lands. lands gathered in from the lands. In, in darkness. In, irons. in the shadow of mine In irons. In affliction. In darkness. In the shadow of death. Let's let's uh, let's. We're not going to have time to, to highlight all of these. If you had an hour to do it, so that's great. Wow. But let's just let's just posit that there's in all the way through it. Let me ask you this: Is that significant? When we when we get to the interpretation phase, is that going to be part of our interpretation? Maybe, maybe, maybe. Yeah, it it's it seems to be talking about situations that you find yourself in, right? Where are you, and where do you want to be, right? Th- that seems to be a contrast there. Um, and I, I want to. I what I want to say here is that uh, dwell in. Also, I mean, certainly in this first one, where you're dwelling seems to be a key point, right? Where are you going to dwell? I, I find it interesting that where you dwell also appears near the end of the passage. All right, where are we there? Help me out. Two, like the, the, from line twenty-one down, uh, he talks about. No, I'm looking at this. Oh no, yeah, he, he, that's the hungry dwell, and they establish a city to live in. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Good. So yeah, this idea of where are you living, where are you living, seems to be a key thing here. Another observation, Karina. Every of those four sections has then they cried to the Lord, and, that's and, and he delivered them. Mm-hmm. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Then he, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. That seems... Oh, good, 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 Veronica. Yes, let me grab my green here. I'll do green for that one. Um, let's peel the green. We're out here. Let them thank the Lord. Let them thank the Lord. Uh, let them thank the Lord. Let them thank the Lord. Right, right. Um, now, 
there's an interesting thing here. Let's, it says, let them do this, let them, let them, let them. And we get in here, and after, after these four are over, we also see some other things that he says, let them. At the end, he says, let him attend to these things. Right? At the end, it says, let him attend to these things. So there's, these are, when it says, let them, it's a command. Right? There's some sort of command being let made here. Oh, yeah, 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 you're right. Let them consider. So let them attend and let them consider. It's a command to pay attention, right? And a command to, uh, to consider this particular question of the steadfast love of the Lord. Somehow, thanking the Lord seems to be the key outcome that needs to happen from each of these scenarios. What else did you see? Uh, Rich? Oh, Donna? Trouble. trouble. Mm. You saw trouble right here in River City. Uh, a lot of trouble. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so. In their trouble, we're crying to the Lord in their trouble. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trouble, trouble. In their trouble, right? Um, and the, the afflictions that start each of them. Right. It, you know, I mean, they don't use the word trouble. Well, here's affliction. Yeah. They're, they're all negative things. Desert waste. Mm. Hungry and thirsty. Fainted. Destruction. Sad and darkness. Sad, mm. Darkness. And iron. Shadow of death. Affliction. Mm. Irons. I mean, these are all negative things. Really? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> There's fools. There were fools, right? Iniquities. Our Suffered. Affliction. Death. Oh. Oh. Yeah. The waves and the stormy and wind. And the stormy wind. wind. Yeah. Good. Courage melted. Evil plight. Evil plight. Real. Just <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a lot of great stuff here, right? Uh, all right. All right. Yeah. Uh, so there's there's all these. And here's an entire paragraph about it, right? When they are diminished and brought low through evil and sorrow. Contempt makes them wander. Yeah. So this is. So there's there there's. Comes back after those things. To you know. The wondrous things he did for his children. Yeah. So I mean, it always comes back to that, doesn't Even, it? Yeah. 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 So it's like. So let me ask you this. That's a good observation. Uh, let's take a look at each. Now let's take a look at each individual scenario, and let's see how they differ from one another. Okay. We've we've talked about how they're similar. How are they different? This first one. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Let's just look at the problem, right? So let's call this the problem, right? Uh, this is not going to work. That's light blue. Let's do orange. All right, here's the problem. Uh, where's the problem here? Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and irons, for they'd rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed their hearts down with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. There's the problem, Right? We know that the problem is over because it says, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. Right? So how do, how do we know what the trouble is? Well, it's everything prior to, then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. Some were, I'll get to you in a minute, Timothy. Some were fools for their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities suffered affliction, they loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Problem. And here's a problem. Some went down to the sea and ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord as wondrous works in the deep, for he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lived, lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. That's the problem. That's a problem. So let's talk about these problems. What's different? Let's, let's, talk, let's, let's take a look. What's different between number one and number two? Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in, hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Some sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they'd rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bowed down their hearts with hard labor. They fell down with none to help. Some of them, the problem is that they aren't, in any, they aren't anywhere, and some of them, the problem is where they are. Okay, so... so that, that, that's kind of so in this one, let's talk about what's the problem here. Wandering. And lost. And then the other lost. Oh, there we go. I like lost. that. We're gonna use the word lost. These folks are lost. And the other one's imprisoned. Imprisoned. Stuck. 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 Yeah, or stuck. 
Stuck is a great word because it ends with k. And k is just a, like Stuck. Kirk. Captain Kirk. Right? <laughs> All right. So yeah, so lost, they're imprisoned or stuck. Um, what about this? Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities, they suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Yeah, that's dying. Dying. Yeah, that's probably. Yeah? I, I was going to say that they're, you know, they brought this on by their... Oh! They're responsible. It's their sinful ways because of their iniquities. They rebelled against the words of God. Okay, so these folks also, it's their fault. They rebelled against the words of God. Who's, who's problem, whose fault is it here? It's nobody's fault. Right? I, I don't, in the first one, I don't see anybody at fault. Some wandered in desert waits, finding, finding no way to a city to dwell in. It's not saying that they're wrong for it. They just happen to be lost. Right? And in, in a situation when they're not responsible for their own problem, they cry out to the Lord and He delivers them. Here's, a, here's one where they'd rebelled against the Word of God. What do they do? Burn they burn the counsel of the Most High. So they're, it's, they are totally responsible. Some were fools through their sinful ways, and because of their iniquities, they suffered affliction. It's their fault. He bowed their hearts down for hard labor. In the second one, yeah. So, so here it's their fault, and God, they'd done something, and God created a situation in which they would be in tr trouble. And then right? saved them from it because and they then, were repentant. Right, right, right. So here, nobody's fault. They just happen to be lost. Here, they've done bad things, and so God actually uses their situation to bring them to their knees. And in here, it's their own fault and it's just the natural consequences of their own fault. What about this last one? Whose fault is it? Some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the great waters. Is that a bad thing? No. 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 They saw the deeds of the Lord, His wondrous works in the deep. That's great. For He commanded and raised the stormy... It's God who makes it happen. Here, it's, it's not their fault at all. They're just going about their business and God sends calamity their way. Right? Right? Oh, my gravy. <laughs> yeah, literally in this case, right? He stirs up the waves. Yeah. They, and I, I, I just want to point out, I mean, I, I love this one because I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sea man. I like, I like the ocean. But I, I read this and it just you can feel it. Right? You get nauseous just reading this passage, right? <laughs> he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven and they went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered like drunken men. They were at, I love the wording of this. It just You can feel that you're on the ocean here. But yeah, so here they're lost, no, no fault of their own. Here they're imprisoned or, or stuck, and it's because of their own fault, but the Lord actually raises the, 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 the consequence. Here they're sick, right? Or, or in some way suffering, um, and, it's, and it, it is, uh, it's the natural consequence of their bad behavior. But here, it's just God who does it, right? Here, their problem is natural. It's a natural disaster. Kind of like the tornado. Yeah. Yeah. And interesting. <laughs> right? So let me ask you this. There was a little girl. Yes. In, in, there was a little girl in Kingston this week who, when the storms came, the tornadoes came, uh, she was out uh, uh, unpacking her car. Her mom, she and her mom came back from shopping. They were unpacking their car. Uh, Newburg. Okay, Newburg. And a tree fell over. 11-year-old girl killed her. Was she killed for her sins? No. But no. she was inside the car, and I think that that may have made a difference, too. Yeah. Although the mother was also inside the car. Things happen, right, in this world. There are calamities that happen in this world that happen through no fault of your own. Sometimes you're just lost. Sometimes you're imprisoned because of your own bad behavior. Sometimes it's the natural consequences of your own behavior. Sometimes it's God bringing about consequences of your bad behavior. But sometimes God just sends storms. Hmm. Yeah. So it's really cool that in all of that, 
Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, right? It's because once we get... I saw that when I read all that stuff. Once we got past the problem, we have the solution, right? They cried to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them from their distress. What happens here? Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them from their distress. They cried to the Lord in their trouble. He delivered them from their distress. Same thing, right? And then what happens? Let's, let's, let's look at the, uh, each passage here uh, individually. What comes in between they cry to the Lord and let them thank the Lord? Mm -hmm. In each section, it's different, and it's exactly what that plight means. All right, so here we have, lost, he led them by a straight way. to a city to dwell in. All right, so here, leadership, right? Leadership and a place to live. Yeah, right, right. They don't say... Right, it'll, it'll, so that'll be in, in the closing, right? It'll, it'll talk about his wondrous works. So here, in the second one, it's their own fault. They've, they've, uh, they rebelled against God's word. What does he do? He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Right? So, that's, so yeah, he bursts their bonds, right? This is, this is release, right? They're imprisoned, and what do they get? They get released. Here... There's contrast. There's yeah. contrast in each one of those prayers. Yeah. yeah, right. The contrast between the problem and the solution. Mm -hmm. Right? They wandered and he led them. They wandered, right. So where's that? Where's wandered, right? Wandered and led. Aimless right? And here we have uh, we have prisoners and burst, right? And here down here we have um, he sent out his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. They're sick and he heals them, right? This so they suffered affliction and healed here with the ships he made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed and it goes on then they were glad that the waters were quiet and he brought them to their desired haven right so so he's uh, he's going to say be still right uh, that's going on here it's interesting that he sent out his word mm. in the third one um, the third scenario he sent out his word and healed them so here we go. He sent out his word and healed them. Have we seen his word anywhere else? They the count. They, oh, they rebelled against the word. Yeah. These guys had rebelled against the words of God. So there's, in the, sec, in the second one and the third one, we have a repetition of the words of God and his word. So here, they rejected the word of God, but here, he, his word is what heals them. Maybe relevant that wickedness shuts its mouth at the very end. Uh... Ooh. Where are we? There. Right Over here? Not all right above yeah, the green 90. circle. 90. All wickedness shuts its mouth. It's maybe there's no words, no wicked words that are being said. Yeah. One of my favorite things that I saw that I found interesting was the way that they refer to God. Most of it, he's the Lord. Okay. So when I do the Lord, I always do blue. So I want to find a blue here. In my, in my Bible study, I always do a blue triangle for the Lord. Okay, so, what, so we have, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. But uh, the second one. They cry to the Lord. When they're talking, they the rebelled Lord. against the words of God. Ooh. He is God, and they rebelled against his words, and they spurned the counsel of the Most High. Like, right. he's the Most High. He should know what he's talking about, but they spurned his counsel. So... Here is an interesting thing. In Hebrew, <laughs> in Hebrew, and I'm not going to write it in Hebrew, <laughs> but when it says the Lord, and usually it's in all caps, it's Yahweh, right? When it says God, it's Elohim, okay? And most high is, I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe it's El Elyon, Okay, is the most high. Um, I could be wrong, but that's, that's my recollection. Um, I always want to note very carefully what a passage says about God, how it describes God, the names that are used for God. Um, so that's why I always use a, a blue triangle, because I'm always going to see that. It, it always will stand out to me uh, when I'm studying it. So I uh, thank the Lord. Uh, these are all, I mean, these are all uh, pronouns. He, 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 he. I'm not going to mark them all. 
uh, the steadfast love of the Lord. Yeah. I just found it interesting that in different roles of him, they refer to him in different ways. Yeah, good point. And now, what's the difference between Yahweh and Elohim? Why, why sometimes the Lord? Why sometimes God? Here's, I'm going to take a step over into interpretation. Okay, what you'll find typically is that the Lord is used in context when someone is personally interacting with God, whereas God is used when God is kind of making bold pronouncements. Okay, God is kind of the creator of the universe, but the Lord is the one you interact with. They're both names for the same uh, being, but uh, God. Elo Elohim is typically used in sort of a more generic sense, whereas Yahweh is, is definitely the God of Israel, always. Yah the word Yahweh is never used for anybody else than the God of Israel. That's so it's... Like so, Father and right, yeah, in some senses. Actually, more like, uh, f more like um, Father and Danish. Okay? Because Yahweh is a specific personal name. Okay? Um, and it's it's only a personal name for the God of Israel. So what? So let's just ask this question. Everywhere it's the Lord, except here. Here it's the words of God and the counsel of the Most High. Why would He use generic words in this second one? Because they're not having a personal relationship. They were specifically rejecting. Yeah, they're not having a personal relationship. Right. Yeah. Isn't that more because of what their sin? Yeah. Yeah, right. They'd rebelled against him. And so they're treating him like a generic God. Right? Um, and they're not interacting with him. At, the problem is they're not interacting with him as a personal God. Right? They pushed him away. And, and also I think it is that the words of God and the counsel of the Most High, these are things that are available to everyone. Right? Everyone can know what God wants from them. Well, you don't have to be in a personal relationship with God to understand what God wants from you. But you have to be in a personal relationship with God in order to fulfill what God wants from you, right? You have to you have to actually cry to the Lord in your trouble. It has to be the Lord, otherwise the salvation does not come. If it's just God, if it's just the generic dude in the sky, uh, it's not happening. But do they ever merge? So there are some passages where it where it's Yahweh Elohim. That's, so they translate it, the Lord God. Yep. There are some passages where it's, it's used, and there's even, uh, there's even a couple of passages where it's like four names of God piled on top of each other. Okay? Uh, and those are passages you really want to pay attention to. So yes, they do, they do put them together. Yeah. Good the question. The first thing that I did when I yeah, was Rich. reading this was, I looked at, and I've done this with other psalms particularly, is, is just looked at all the action verbs and everything God does. Yeah, good. Good, yeah. It, that's a great thing to do, and I, I love doing that. That's a, that's a fantastic thing to do when you're doing manuscript study. Asking, what does the Lord do? Like, what specifically does the Lord do? So let me find a color we haven't used yet. What color is this? Alright, well, it's brown. Is that, you want brown? No. I want, let me give me like a dark green here. Give me a dark green. Oh, here's an interesting green. Okay, so let's let's do some of what the Lord does. He, redeemed, he has redeemed from trouble. He has redeemed. Okay, right? He has gathered in. Yeah. Uh, he satisfies the longing soul. Oh, yeah. He satisfies the longing soul. He fills the hungry soul with good things. So everyone's going to say that. He delivered. He led them. Oh yeah, he bowed their hearts down. And that was one I wanted to ask about. Yeah, well that's a good one to, to ask about. He brought them out of the darkness. And he burst their bonds. Um, he shatters. He cuts. Some are fools. Cry Lord in trouble. He delivered again from their stress. He sent his word. And he healed them. He delivered them. Okay, uh, go here. For he commanded, he raised. Oh, come back. He raised. Uh, 
the waves lifted. He delivered. He made the storm be still. Uh, he brought them, yeah, to their desired haven. Um, here's what he's do. He turns rivers into a desert. He turns. Uh, he lets the hungry dwell. Um, they, by by his blessing, this is an interesting case here. By his blessing, they multiply greatly, and he does not let their livestock. He pours contempt on princes and makes them wander in trapless wastes. But he raises up the needy. Yeah, what does the Lord do? The Lord is very active in this. He's doing stuff. This is not just even in the even in the passage where uh, where they're just on their own. The Lord is doing stuff. He's doing stuff here in, the, in delivering them and leading them and satisfying and filling them. Um, but the Lord is, is very active in all these things. Yeah, Timothy. One thing I'll, I'll say, and I, I did this too, I won't get into much at all, all the things the Lord does. And one thing I noticed when I did that is that in the first two uh, scenarios, mm -hmm. uh, after they thank the Lord for his steadfast love, it, 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 typically there's something after that. Mm -hmm. um, in the first two, it's something the Lord has done. He, he satisfies the longing soul. soul. He shatters the doors of bronze. In the second two, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's telling us to do something. Yeah, interesting. Right. It's, it's let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving. Let them praise Him in the assembly. Okay. Uh, Extol Him. I like that. Right. So, so here we have, uh, here's, here's what God does. Here's what God does. And here's what we do. Ooh, and here's what we do. Right? So there's a little tag at the end of every one of these scenarios. Um, it's, it's, it's saying, let them thank the Lord. Why should they thank the Lord? Well, because he satisfies the longing soul. Why should they thank the Lord? Well, he satisfies the doors of bronze. Why should they thank the Lord? No, it doesn't say why in these ones. It says, here's more stuff to do. Thank the Lord and offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds and songs of joy. Here it says, let them thank the Lord for steadfast love that works for the children of men and then let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. So here, what, sh what should we do? Well, we should praise God, some sort of a private praise, right? Let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving, tell of his deeds and songs of joy, private praise, And here we have, let them extol him in the congregation of the people and praise him in the assembly of the elders. Public praise. Right? Um, so there's, ah, yeah, boy, interesting things here, right? Private, pra praise him privately, praise him publicly. The Lord does this, 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 this. He's doing all sorts of great things. Let's, because uh, of time, let's take a look here at these last two sections here. This is, this is more poetic. So we, we've, we've moved from the scenarios to sort of just commentary on who God is. He turns rivers into a desert, springs of water to a thirsty ground. Uh, because of the evil of its inhabitants, he does this. He, 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 uh, he, he punishes the land because of the evil of its inhabitants. But then he turns the desert back into pools of water and lets the hungry dwell there. And they get established. They sow fields. They plant vineyards. They get a fruitful yield. <laughs> Some things God does directly. Some things God blesses them and they do. Right? When they're diminished and brought low through oppression, evil and sorrow, he pours contempt on princes and makes them wander and makes them wander in trackless wastes. Where's that been? Oh, that's interesting. He makes them wander in trackless wastes. Oh, wait a second. Uh, where is that up here? Where are we? Wandered in desert wastes. Oh, I'm going to do this. Uh. Uh. Right? Oh, not, I'm not gonna, we're not going to do too much of this, but that's interesting. So, right, right? There seems to be actually a cause for people wandering in trackless wastes sometimes. Right? Sometimes it's his punishment on princes who uh, put themselves too high up. And if they cry to the Lord, then he will get them back out of there. <laughs> that's right. Even the situations God causes, there's a way out. 
Uh, I love this in this last paragraph here when they're diminished and brought low through oppression, evil and sorrow, diminished, brought low, pours contempt on them, but he raises up the needy out of affliction. Right? So there's a down and an up which is going on there. The upright see it and are glad. Hmm? You're talking about two different sets of people there. Yes. The one set is the princes and the people in power and the other set are the oppressed. Right. So here so here's the so here's the thing. We don't want to, we, we we made this observation and we just need to say what do we draw from that observation? And if we draw too much from it, if what we say is everybody who's wandering in a desert waste must have been a bad guy, no, that's that's not about good observation because other observations show us that this is this is on princes. Uh, that, that this happens. Poor. Yeah, so you're talking about rich and poor, those who are high, those who are low. But not all princes are bad. Some no, no, no. Some will be generous and give their wealth and not be mean and dictator -y. Yeah, absolutely. Praise God. All right, so now we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do... We spent most of our time on observation. We've got three minutes left, four minutes left. What are we going to do for interpretation? Let me ask you this. I'm going to move this over. For you people on video, you just have to remember what's on there. First, let me just ask this question. Why do all this stuff? This helps me to see it better. This helps me to see it better today. If I come back to this a year from now, this is going to be confusing as sin, right? <laughs> I'm going to come to this and be like, what was I thinking? I might be able to piece it back together, but this is just in the moment. This helps me. When, every time I study a passage, I pull a new manuscript out, even if I've studied it before, because the old manuscript doesn't really help me very much. I need to see it with fresh eyes. But, what are, the, so let's just sort of take a step back. Let's, everybody breathe in. Breathe out. Let's ask this question. What are the most important things that we saw? Ba not, not based on what you think, but based on what seems to be the case in this passage. What are the most important things that we saw? The things that seem to stand out, that the passage seems to emphasize more than any other through, through its different means. The relationship between God and, and the, His people. Okay, yeah, there's a relationship between God and His people. What, is, what do we learn about the relationship between God and his people? Well, he's always there with them. God is there. Faithful. Steadfast love. And he responds. God responds. When they cry out. We should respond. Or, yeah. Well, I think that that represents a need for our starting some relationship. It's not that Absolutely. he doesn't oh isn't always in relationship with us, but we have to acknowledge him mm, always. Mm, and mm. we don't. So so the start of our relationship is a cry for help. Well it can be it can also be thanks giving thanks to him for you know you, I, you often hear uh, with, pray with prayers of, of petition and thanksgiving sure so well and that's that's a major theme here too right mm -hmm. uh, this is repeated in every one of these scenario is let them thank the Lord right it requires effort on our part mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. and sometimes first but the one scenario here really didn't require that first. Which one? The last one. It didn't really require that we... Well, because God starts that scenario. Right. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's an act of God, as they say. Yeah, right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't like you're standing in the middle of the storm going, thank you, Lord, for this storm. No, no, absolutely. In fact, they, they're not very thankful at all right. until God actually okay. calms it down. Key questions to ask when you're interpreting. What does this passage teach me about God? What does this passage teach about us? What does this passage teach about Christ? And what does this passage teach about our response? Now those are categories you've seen before when we were talking about evangelism, right? What does it mean to cry out to the Lord? Okay, so... That he would hear 
hear That's a great question. Response. That's a great question. So what does it mean for us to cry out to the Lord? So there's, how do we answer that question? We'll answer that question in a couple different ways. The tools that we can use to answer that question are this passage. We can ask, okay, does this passage give us any indication of what crying out to the Lord means? When do we cry out to the Lord? Do we cry out when we're in anguish? Or do we cry out for joy? Okay, so in this passage, in this passage, when do we cry out to the Lord? In anguish, right? Now, we can add to that from other passages. As, as we go to other passages, we can learn more things about crying out to the Lord. But in this passage, we cry out to the Lord in anguish, right? This is a passage about crying out to the Lord in anguish. However, it's... Sorry, go ahead. It cry out always means that we recognize something... And know where to turn for yeah. help. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and when you worship the same kind of thing. Well, you worship yeah. because it's coming from him, acknowledge that it's not mine. You cry out and to cry the Lord as opposed to yeah. somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Well it certainly it certainly matters who you cry out to. Yeah. yeah. Now well, there in the first one though it says, Let them thank the Lord. So, I mean, it's they also well, cry out to the Lord crying out. Well, they do here. They cry out to the Lord in their trouble, right? But then, let them thank the Lord. So, yeah. every one of them has two, has, has a dual movement, right? Cry to the Lord in your trouble, and then thank the Lord when He's delivered you. Cry out, thank Him. Cry out, thank Him. This is the pattern that this passage establishes. That's not the only pattern. We added to it from other passages. But as we're studying this passage, we're asking, what does this passage say to us? It says, cry to the Lord in your trouble, and when He delivers you, thank Him. Thank does it matter if the trouble is your fault or somebody else's fault? No. Cry out to the Lord. What if it's God's fault? What if God puts you in the situation? Cry out to the Lord. What if it's not your fault at all? Cry out to the Lord. Right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what scenario you're in. Cry to the Lord. Okay, well, now God's done something. What should you do? Does it matter if it was your fault? No, thank him. Does it matter if it's God's fault? No, thank him. It doesn't matter what the scenario was. The response is to thank him. I think that's right? why they use four different examples for it. Well, so, so what, what this method allowed us to do easily is to see some of the contrasts between these, these scenarios. It can be really easy when you read this to just glaze over it because there's so much repetition. But when you start paying attention to the repetition, you can see that there are some things that are repeated, but there are some things that are very different. So it, it drew our attention. Because we were doing this, it drew our attention to the things that were different. And, and all the different scenarios in which crying out to the Lord is so important. Was this the one thing with... Yeah. Uh, no, I don't think it is. The one thing with the four scenarios goes back to the very first paragraph where it talks about from all parts of the earth, hmm. east, west, north, and south. Huh. So, now this is a scenario in which pulling out an atlas might be really helpful, okay? I, because I, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here. Let's, let's look at, uh, at Israel. Uh, let's see. So, what's to the, what's to the east of Israel? Uh, desert. desert. Okay. That's, we, this might be all right. What's to the west of Israel? Desert. Ocean. Uh, okay, so we're not going exactly in this, right? But but yeah, there's four. There are four components here: east, west, north, south. Maybe he's maybe he gives us four examples because of that. They go to the sea in ships. They do in, in so yeah, so so but so but they're not. It's not following the same order. No. Not following east, west, north, south. It's it looks like it's following east. Maybe south. It's all all the possibilities. Yeah. yeah. So that's great. That's great. Yeah. Your fault, my fault, God's fault. That's Nobody's great. Fault. That's great. Sometimes what the Bible does is it uses something called synecdoche. 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 Schenectady is a, is a city in New York. But here's here's a great here's a great here's a great. Here's a great uh, It's a great word, a great uh, theological word, synecdoche. That's what it is, synecdoche. A synecdoche is, is, a, is a key? I think it's synecdoche. C-H-E? I think so. Okay. Uh, you may be right. But, but what it is, is what it, whatever it is. Uh, however, however it's spelled. It's connected in New York. It's all about using, using parts to indicate the whole. 
Okay? Uh, in other words, when I, when I came to Karina and I said, will you give me your hand in marriage? <laughs> she hesitated. <laughs> She's 20 years smarter than she was the first time I asked that question. When I asked for Karina's hand in marriage, I wasn't just asking for her hand. That's why I didn't know what to do. I was asking for all of her, right? Uh, so using parts to indicate the whole. So here we have east, west, north, south indicates everywhere, right? Yeah, so good, good point, good point. And I also think that the scenarios, like the last one for me when I was reading it, was the most important mm. in many respects because I've learned that in the troubled times and in the dark times and things that I didn't think I created right, right. Um, God uses those things to enrich my awareness of him or grow me somehow yeah or so to me that's the most important because the other ones, I play a part in, but that one I don't until I have grown. You got it. She's just oh, rich, rich, rich found it online. D O C H E. D O C H E. And it's uh, using a part for a whole. Synecdoche. Yeah. So, so these four scenarios give everybody something to identify with. Right? When the, in these four scenarios, everybody has something to s identify with. I don't know. Uh, so for Veronica, the fourth scenario is the one she most identifies with. For me, it's the second scenario. And in the second scenario, I think about, I think about my father, who was um, an alcoholic. And I see, and God delivered him from his alcoholism. But I see in my life the sort of tendencies that would lead me to become an addict. And I see the, the addictive tendencies in my life, and I think, oh my gosh, this is me. If God didn't deliver me, I would be in the shadow of death and in chains, mm -hmm. right? So for me, this second scenario is very powerful. I don't know which one it is for you. Maybe it's bits of and pieces from different ones. But what the passage is telling us is whatever situation you're in, wherever you find yourself, Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. And He, uh, he is the one who delivers you. I, we'll see this in all of these. He's the one who will deliver you from any situation that you're in. Observe. What does it mean? And then apply. What does it mean to me? What it means to you is very personal. It's got to be based on what's actually here. What this means to me is that I need to go and buy a dozen donuts. Uh, maybe not the application you want out of this. Um, you got to connect your application even to the passage. What's this passage telling me? Um, and the reason for that is that we want to be taught by the scriptures. We don't want to be taught by just our feelings, right? This is the Manuscript Bible Study Method. Thank you for trucking with me on this, uh, tracking with me on this. I think this is a, a great method. Here's what your homework is for this. No, not your homework. Here's what your deeper discovery is for this week. You don't have to do this. I asked you this last week to do something for specific. But this week, I want you to do this. If you, if you feel like you want to continue in this method, give it a shot. I, I want to encourage you to pick your favorite Bible passage. Your favorite Bible passage. The passage that means the most to you. And uh, go to BibleGateway.com or a Bible program. Uh, copy it. Put it into a word processor document. Print it out. And, and just do this method on your favorite passage. Spend 15, 20 minutes, spend it 40 minutes or an hour, and observe in your favorite passage and see what the Lord brings to your mind. See if in your favorite passage that you know so well, that's spoken to you so much, if God has something more He wants to say to you in that passage that you love so much. Maybe there's something more that God has for you even in that passage. Uh, I want to encourage you. This is one of my favorite passages. Um, this is very encouraging to me. I hope it was to you tonight as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you sent your word and healed them. Lord, I pray that, you would, that, that, I pray that your word would heal us day by day. 
Lord, I pray that as whatever situation we find ourselves in, whatever trouble, whatever difficulty we find ourselves in, that you would help us and empower us to cry out to you in our trouble. And thank you that your steadfast love endures forever, that you're going to come and deliver us in whatever situation we find ourselves in if we cry out to you. Lord, help us not to rebel against the words of God. Help us not to, to spurn the counsel of the Most High. As we study this passage, Lord, let us take that warning to heart, but rather to, to uh, let us attend to these things. Let us consider the steadfast love of the Lord and give you public praise, give you private praise, and to, to reflect on the good things that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, everybody. Uh, so next week, I haven't decided if we're going to do another week of studying the Bible or if we're going to go to the next topic. We, we reached the end of what I kind of wanted to do, but I, I might have some other thoughts on it. We're meeting next week, even though it's Memorial Day. Hmm. We had off for Mother's Day. <laughs> so I'm not sure what you're saying there. Right? <laughs> um, yeah, so, so uh, how many folks are going to be away from Memorial Day weekend? The Whitsons will? Oh, just me. Oh, just Allie? Yeah. <laughs> um, do you guys have... I don't know. Look inside. Let's, let's, let's take off for Memorial Day. Let's do that. We'll take off for Memorial Day. So we'll meet in two weeks. Okay?